So welcome to the second part of the Afterthoughts edition on the Wildstein Sonata. It was a very long uh, segment, so I decided to cut it in two. In the previous uh, segment, I talked about Beethoven, the relationship with the clavichord and things like that. And in this segment, I will dive a little bit more into the notation questions of this Wildstein Sonata. And also on some changes I had to make in order to perform or make this uh, piece of work on the clavicle that's coming up. So, just to go briefly to the piece, I want to give you, um, not clarification, but I want to talk on two topics. First, on notation, again, we're doing that a lot, I know, but it's extremely important and two on the things I have to change, I had to change in this sonata. The first piece actually playing original, original keyboard work where I make some changes, where I had to make some changes. So, first notation. You, you might have noticed that I play slower than in most performances that you find um, on records, on discs or on YouTube. And I know that the piece is often played like this. I play it slower. And if you are used to the faster performances, I've said that before, but I repeat it often, it's important, then it is difficult to return to a slower performance. You have to get used to that. The notation again is here in 4-4 four, four bar structure. It's a really normal tempo ordinario bar structure with 16 notes as the fastest notes value. But you can, you can, I would have been surprised and I wouldn't be surprised, I haven't looked it up, if the manuscript, if it's still preserved, would have not this common C but the so called C with, this, with the stroke. So the fast 4-4 four, four bar structure. And it doesn't, it's not important because in this notation you have a natural feeling for heavy accents on one and three, which you have in every 4-4 four, four bar structure, but here it's much more because you have also this. So you are playing a little bit over the quarter note. But having said that, Beethoven starts with eight notes, and I cannot emphasize that enough. If a composer at that time starts with eight notes, he doesn't mean this. This, these are really sixteenth notes in a very fast allegro, because you have the one, two, three, four, five, one, one, two, three, and it's not what what the race there is one. One, two, three, four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So from the moment that you feel as a player or as a listener that you have more than two notes in one beat, then you have 16 notes in one beat. And that's not a notation. It's simple as that. And so when he had when Beethoven had this theme in his mind. He, of course, had to look for a notation and he chose eight notes. He didn't choose 16 notes. Um, so I'm quite convinced, and that's my conviction, and I cannot point to a source. Yeah, you have the metronome numbers, and if you, that's an eternal discussion. If you would take Chinese metronome number, it's even slower. Jenny also writes very accentuated. It sounds beautiful in that tempo, but I've chosen a little bit faster. So that's one point, uh, the notation of that. Then you have the 16th note, and actually the increase of, of tempo by doing that is, is immense. And also you have this very tranquil, that is, you know, this Aurora Sonata, the sunrise. So it's very, very silent here. Pianissimo. That's a bird. 
and then he shifts from C major to B flat major, which is of course, and because he, he stays so long on C major and in this tempo it's really long. Kind of C major, he makes a modulation to G, but. We know the piece, but imagine that you haven't, that you didn't hear it before. What, a tri what an incredible impression that this makes from going this chord. But Sunrise, that's how I see the piece, Aurora Sonata. There's nothing, and certainly there is a shift of color because the sun is from one moment to another. There's not, there's not, there's, there's not a, a, a bridge between complete darkness and light. There is light at a certain moment, and it's very orange. It's very, it's a totally other color than, 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 than the darkness that went before. And the bird, of course, has. Is the first one. I don't know the name of the bird in, in English that goes up in the morning. Uh, this is the first one that recognizes the light. So. The bird. Light. Of course, then the sun is coming. very legato and leidenschaftlich, which means kind of with much expression. So it, the tempo is very relative, because if you play it much faster, you, your pulse, that you, the pulse that you feel is actually much slower. Here you have the bass. Going to this climate. And these passages, they are very difficult. They are very difficult because actually you require the sustaining pedal. Imagine if I just played like you would play it on piano. And the finger changing substitutions, so to say, are working. That doesn't. They don't work very well on the on the clavicle. So in order to play that on clavichord, I just make it a little bit less legato. Although Beethoven is is asking for dolce in molto legato. Oh, that is really difficult. Here it gets it's okay. But you cannot on clavichord, what you can do on the piano on a piano forte, just whisper with the with 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 with, uh, with the hammers so that you have this this lighter notes that are just ornaments like you would have here. I can't demonstrate it because the clavichord really requires a firm tone, a very decent tone. So if I play this music on the clavichord, I just change the dynamics if I need to. Also here, you have these passages which on the pianoforte you would play much more legato, but it's difficult on clavichord to do and it's not nice. So.
also clear demonstration of, of the power of the soundboard. And I don't have an F sharp here, so I play it just one octave low. So that's a minor change, change of the um, of the keys. Same here. And so on. So that's very difficult because you have to imitate. You, you cannot imitate the kind of sustaining pedal effect on the piano. So it's impossible, so I don't do it. I make it a little bit more, much more articulated and therefore it becomes more Baroque. And also here, it's a bit of a, uh, indicates pianissimo, which is impossible. Here really you on the edge of the clavichord, if you play this piano, pianissimo, it's, it's impossible to play pianissimo in over, in this. I wouldn't say impossible, but it's extremely difficult. And I don't, I think on the clavichord you can, you can change that. So I try to do is really make it very legato there. And so change the touch a little bit so that you have this drive towards what's coming. And then of course, what's coming is here the total uh, climax and, and freedom actually from, from this very tense movement. Okay, and then we're coming to one final place where I had to change things. You have here the second and the repetition, the second uh, choral. And I play it as I can on clavichord, because these chords they are really impossible to play beautiful. So in a kind of legato singing uh, style. So I just change that and make it And then I'll put the same. So in the 18th century, people wouldn't have even realized that I had to change something because they didn't know the music up front. So that was a long aftertoast, and that's the reason why I uh, chose to separate it in two parts because it's too long. So first part on the instrument and Beethoven and the clavichord, and second on the uh, Waldstein Sonata itself. Um, there is really extremely much to tell about this music and uh, I hope that I clarified some elements and that you can take some ideas from that. Like these Afterthought editions are just snapshots. Okay, thank you for watching and uh, thank you for subscribing to the channel as always and sharing this video with your friends and we see each other very soon. Okay, bye.